Mauga's entrance into the game has definitely made him really strong, and although he's bound to be toned down by the midseason patch, it's clear Blizzard wants to keep him in an above average state. Let's get into the DPS tier list for Mauga Meta, a weird new type of brawl that can play super fast or super slow, and find out who's the best and worst. If you're looking for more in depth content like this, make sure to use the link in the description to get access to a Game Leap membership. There are tons of guides with full coverage for all your favorite heroes, and even courses that can help you with overall game knowledge. Starting at the bottom, in D tier, these heroes have basically zero synergy with Mauga. They barely even fight the same targets most of the time. So, first off, it's Widowmaker. This is no big surprise at all. When the enemy tank has two sources of damage reduction, a gap closer, and a very precise ranged weapon, Widow can feel pretty limited when the fights come down to a scrappy frontline brawl. She gets no realistic use out of Cardiac Overdrive, and although she can still play well on her strong maps, she's not exactly farming Malga when she does. Regardless, it's not like Widowmaker is a meta pick ever anyway, and the way balance has been going lately, that's not bound to change. Her low health bar keeps her from being anywhere close to being a dominating force, and it also allows Malga to kill her faster with a quick switch chain gun combo. The second hero in D tier fares a bit better, but only because of the fact that she is also unkillable while in Cardiac Overdrive just like every other hero in the game. It's Farah who can actually use that duration to do something instead of shaking in her boots up in the skybox, but unfortunately not for very long at all. Outside of those 5 golden seconds, Farah is just another easy target for Mauga or Baptiste or even Bastion whose recon form is more than enough to keep her at bay. Even her barrage can't really do anything against Mauga himself, and her hitbox is the perfect size for him to deal maximum critical damage to her even up to ranges of 20 meters. The only good thing is that Farah's barrage can more than obliterate Mauga's cage fight. She only needs a little over 1 second to destroy the shield with enough rockets left to deal up to 1800 damage, just enough to to force Malga's shortest cooldown and see him run away gracefully. Moving on to C tier, we start with Junkrat. He may not be as detached as Widowmaker or as weak as Farah, but he still has a lot of weaknesses in the Malga meta. Just like Farah, his hitbox is big enough to get farmed by Malga at most ranges, and he's not exactly a frontline brawling hero either. Riptire is really tough too, since it can't even kill Malga at full health, much less with any of his damage reduction effects active. Even for a generally weak hero, Junkrat can still deal a lot of damage to big tanks, Malga included. In fact, if he does get peeled by his supports, he can actually punish hard with a lot of damage. But the biggest problem still remains that he can't hold positions or rotate between them without being a massive target for Malga's spread. Sombra is also in C tier. She's got a lot of pros, but also a lot of cons. Let's start with how effective hack is. Against Malga, your hack explicitly doesn't cancel overrun, so you can't even play to halt his escape. Malga already takes an insane amount of damage, so the virus doesn't really help that much, even though you're pretty much guaranteed to hit it. The one thing that is good is that Sombra has a skinnier hitbox than most and a high damage spread weapon. You can actually be a solid main DPS when it comes to focusing down the tank, but specifically against Malga, her abilities really falter. You can't ever stop Malga from running away, and you can't even cancel his aura. It's not a channeled interruptible ability. You might not die easily to him, but you won't be able to contribute much to killing him besides just your normal damage. It is also really worth mentioning that EMP cancels cage fight and it can be very clutch for saving a teammate or even allowing yourself to escape. But then again, EMP is best used aggressively, and it charges slower than cage fight. You can't cancel them all. To sum it up, her utility that would normally work against other tanks simply don't against Mauga, and although she can deal good damage, Mauga's self-sustain is simply way above good. Now we're moving on to B tier, also known as the point and click shooting guy tier. You'll get what I mean once I start naming names, and the first one is Torbjorn. He's as strong as he is usually, but against Malga he loses some of his specialties, one of them being his tank busting. Torb can be really great for dealing a lot of tank damage. Winston, for example, just cannot win in a 1v1 against a Torb with Overload. But against the Malga, every time you face to deal damage, you can be easily ignited and bursted down. Torb's dwarfish square hitbox is really easy to deal full damage to. He's even easy to headshot, meaning Malga can farm crits off him before even igniting. But his damage output when threatened is still good, and he can actually do quite a lot during Cardiac Overdrive. He can even fill Cage Fight with Molten Core for a massive combo. And any heroes affected by Molten Core actually count as burning targets. They can 100% be crit by Malga. It's one of the most ultimate ultimate combos that can pretty much break through any Anything. Torb's hitbox may hold him back, but he's still a viable pick if you complete the off angles right, dealing enough damage to match your ultimate rate with Malga's. Next up is Cassidy. Normally he would be in a lower tier on this list, but he actually has some pretty effective abilities both with Malga and against him. Cassidy's hindering grenade is actually the only thing that can stop Malga from running away for more than the short duration of a stun. After getting stuck by the grenade, Malga can't run away for 1.25 seconds, giving you and your team a window to blast him with all you've got. And don't forget, the grenade also slows by 25%, adding onto Malga's own chain gun slows to line him up for easy headshot damage before he runs away. And when it comes comes to playing with Malga, his normally useless ultimate combos perfectly with heroes caught inside a domed area they can't escape. These are all great matchups, but he's at the bottom of B tier. His hitbox is still too massive even with the extra health. When close range Malga comps go against Cassidy, they'll eat him up most of the time. His hitbox doesn't just make him vulnerable to Malga either, but it's one of the main reasons why he loses often to other DPS in the long range duel. And to make things worse, his falloff range is even lower than Malga's. Moving on to Soldier 76. I think you can see the pattern of spamming heroes in B tier by now. At least Soldier is more effective, his damage is top notch, and he's really capable of dodging Malga's pressure. Unless he is miles away from cover, it's unlikely Malga can get the pick even with a perfect chain gun combo. He's also extremely unkillable in Cardiac Overdrive even if you're not hitting every shot. The problem with Soldier though is that he's a great heavy damaging off angle that's hard to kill, but he lacks any other utility. Even his
his visor isn't good at letting his team push past Malga. He'll be a great asset in the backline just to deal damage or even to contest other players, but when it comes to actively winning the Malga meta matchup instead of just holding angles, Soldier isn't quite elite enough. Now to switch things up with Echo. Although she's still a long range spamming hero, at least her playstyle is way more active and divey thanks to her flight and close range focusing beam. Echo is able to handle the weakness of a larger flying hitbox way better than Farrah can, and if she can survive peeking Malga for a decent while, she can actually get value out of being a target. When playing as Malga in the mirror or against the high damaging tank, it's really critical to deal critical damage to keep yourself alive through your passive. Shooting tanks or big hitboxes allow you to more consistently do that. Echo's own hitbox and movement make her decently less easy to track all the time, and that means that she can dip and dodge to avoid pressure, while your tank can deal as much damage to the Malga as they want without getting farmed for crits. It's a simple attention play, where you use the weakness of your hero as bait while playing careful and reactive. But that's really where it all ends. Her damage, while consistent against Malga, is equally ineffective at finishing him off. Even focusing beam falters against how good Overrun is at hitting the bricks and quick. Moving on to Hanzo, it's back to pointing and shooting. Hanzo has a lot of the benefits that the worst heroes in B tier have, without all the weaknesses. His damage alone is great, and he doesn't need to be anywhere near Malga to get value. Even the rhythm of Hanzo's arrows makes it easy to avoid getting ignited, as long as you have cover. And with wall climb, you can always find a strong position. He's got an average hitbox, which does mean you can't stand your ground against Malga, but it's not to the point where you'll die every time you peek. And before we move on, we have to ask the important question. Does he combo with Cage Fight? And the answer is yes. Dragon Strike is absolutely amazing when combined with Cage Fight and is one of the best ultimates for it. Strong but not broken, although we're getting quite close to the heroes that are. And Ash shows a new kind of synergy with Malga that definitely can't be underrated. Her dynamite burn effect counts towards Malga's critical hits, and because it's immediately applied and has a longer duration, it can actually be really clutch for swinging aggressively with a damage advantage. Dynamite is already a strong ability that usually needs to be cleansed, which helps a lot when you're forcing abilities. As for the common weak points like her ultimate and her hitbox, although Bob gets absolutely shredded by Malga, her hitbox is good enough to avoid getting instantly ignited. It is still very bad that Bob is pretty much useless, it has to be said, but whenever Malga isn't killing him, he can still split the enemy team. Otherwise, the synergy with Dynamite and an advantage in the ranged duel gives her a lot of options at winning the Malga Mirror. And finally, at the top of B tier, we have Symmetra. She's the first hero to not have any sort of significant disadvantage into Malga. Closest it gets is that her teleporter can be set on fire and then deleted with crits. Most of the time, that won't really matter. Her primary fire does place her in vulnerable range against Malga. That much is true, but you don't always have to be in the front line to be effective as Sim anymore. You can time your presence in the front line for when you actually have an advantage, whether your own Malga is pushing with his own cardiac overdrive or any one of your teammates are using their ultimate, including you. Photon Barrier cannot be set on fire, which means the most Malga can do is 144 DPS, which is barely anything against against your ultimate's 4000 HP. Your teleporter may die slightly faster, but just regular bullets that don't even cleave have never been a threat to it anyway. It is still a god tier ability for repositioning, as well as escaping from cage fight, one of the only ways possible to do so. Sim is really good, but she's not quite in the top ranks of the Malga meta. She's too slow and also too vulnerable in the brawl, although she's definitely a fine hero for games without Lucio or Mei. Finally, onto A tier, with only 6 heroes remaining, the first up is Bastion. Despite having a massive hitbox, his damage output and his damage resistance make him somewhat stable at handling Malga. Somewhat stable is really the best way to put it. Both Bastion's and Malga's health bars will be spiking up and down as the two fight. And the reason why Bastion beats out all the other spamming heroes despite having the most farmable hitbox is because of the tempo he brings with his turret form. Bastion's turret form lasts for 6 seconds and has a 12 second cooldown. Cardiac Overdrive has a 5 second duration and a 10 second cooldown. Because the numbers are so close, you can stack the abilities together for an unbelievably powerful push. And after your engage is finished, you just wait and repeat. Being able to disintegrate everyone in front of you without fear of dying makes him an invaluable pick. Even if the engage can be kited or baited, the ability to pull it out at any moment gives a lot of power to the Bastion team. Don't forget that damage reduction sources below 50% stack together, so 30% from Overdrive and 20% from Bastion's Ironclad passive gives a sweet total of 50%, the maximum you can get from combining the sources. And of course, the lifesteal makes you basically invincible unless you have Symmetra's Photon Barrier in front of you. Even Reinhardt and Sigma will get overwhelmed by a Bastion that can peak for the full duration of his turret form. And once again, you know we've got to do an ultimate synergy check, and Bastion passes with flying colors. Three artillery strikes in a small enclosed area, you already know how devastating that can be. So Bastion is still good, but outside of his turret form, he struggles to compete with heroes that can be a bit more skirmishy, that don't have to commit as hard to get the job done. And the first one has got to be Tracer. She's great into Malga, and although she doesn't really need the aura, it's a solid bonus. One thing about Tracer is that she's really necessary on the wider maps, where flanks and open space make it much easier to handle the Malga rush comps, like the ones that use the Bastion turret form overdrive combo. Pulse Bomb doesn't really work against Malga himself, but it's a great spike of damage on other heroes that fits right in after some cooldowns have been forced. It's easy to assume that Malga makes only rush and brawl comps viable, but his inability to force out Tracer consistently is actually pretty unique for a tank. Even Winston can quickly get her off the objective, while Malga has to chase her looking for a chain gun ignition. She's a more balanced option. Don't forget how good she is on maps where objective pressure makes a big difference. You don't always need to focus everything on killing the unkillable frontline when you can split the enemy team with good objective focus. And of course, there has to be a brawl and dive hybrid, someone who can benefit from Malga's overdrive and speedy engages while also being able to access areas he can't. And you already know that Genji is that guy. As the second best in A tier, it's a pretty strong position. His normal weaknesses that we all complain about don't really drag you down in the Malga matchup. The only thing you need to actively work 
worry about is getting caught by an enemy cage fight. You can still use your dash to dodge it and you're deflected by some time until you can get some help. One of the best things about Genji, now that Mauga's in the game, is that Dragon Blade can actually be a hard committal tool now. He simply won't die in overdrive unless he's been anti-healed. Although you might still slash both supports 9 times without killing them, at least you'll be able to escape afterwards. But jokes aside, Genji really is good with Mauga, and against him, his deflect is especially good at playing dangerously and aggressively while still dodging Mauga's execution damage. Just like how Junker Queen raised up Genji on her release, Mauga's done the same. Team aura buffs are just perfect for Genji to get the assistance needed to be a dominating force again. And finally, Sojourn at the top of A tier? Things are clearly getting weird if Sojourn isn't the number one best DPS. But apparently, even when she's not at the top, she's sitting right outside as the third most viable hero out of them all. It's not so much that she's weak with or against Smelga. She builds easy railgun charge against them as much as Roadhog and Wrecking Ball give. She's just a more passive pick. She builds her rails, stays alive, and hits shots. Passive doesn't mean you're not moving around the map looking for picks, but it does mean that when both teams meet, you have to play further back instead of using the Cardiac Overdrive up in the fray. She isn't really a weaker pick because of this, and she actually brings a lot of control to the comp where the prime directive is otherwise 3 to one go 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 it is pretty funny that Mauga has launched with control over both the slow methodical game and also the 3 to one go 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 style, but Cardiac Overdrive gives the latter a massive advantage over passive play. And with that, we're finally at the top 2 heroes in S tier, starting with Mei. She's gotten a lot more respect after easily hanging with the Sigma Brawl comp in Season 7, and she's still great at manipulating the tank matchup. Her hitbox is big, her ice wall can get ignited, but what's really important is that instant value. What can Mei bring to the fattest engager team can muster? And the answer is isolation and slows. With ice wall, it doesn't matter how fast it breaks, it briefly blocks backline support and allows you to close the distance on an isolated target. After that, her slow is what forces Mauga to run away. If Mauga's forced out, he can't melt you with his double chain guns, the one weakness Mei has in this meta. Mei's ice block is also perfect for handling the best counter the Cardiac Overdrive besides another Cardiac Overdrive, Anti-Nade. While Mauga can't cleanse the effect for himself, if his teammates can quickly shed the effect and keep abusing the aura, the fight will still go on. And the biggest reason why she's so good with Mauga is easy. 250 health. Any hero with more than 200 health is massively improved by Cardiac Overdrive, even more than normal. And for a hero like Mei who gets more value the deeper she gets, a super regenerating and damage resisting aura is amazing for achieving that goal. But now, let's finish up the tier list with the top DPS of Mauga's meta, Reaper. That's right, the second 250 HP brawler is a champion once again and it's a wild step up from the depth she was at before Mauga and his aura were added to the game. Reaper's already existing lifesteal makes him totally invincible to everything except one-shots during the overdrive push. He heals disgusting amounts of health and also tears through Mauga at mid-range, even against his lifesteal. And just like Mei, his wraith form helps massively to dodge anything coming your way. Reaper is very much still a niche pick, but that niche has gotten massively better, to the point where any combination of Reaper, Mei, and Sojourn with Mauga will make for an insanely strong composition, even if you're not planning any crazy overdrive moves. Reaper mains can totally rejoice because even when Mauga gets inevitably nerfed, Cardiac Overdrive will almost certainly still be good enough to support some baller Reaper play. That's it for the DPS tier list for Season 8's Malga Meta. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you next time.